All right. Good afternoon again, everybody. So once again, this is Dave Broadbent. I'm the Education Director here at ABYC, and I will uh, have John Aidy, our president, with us also. So I uh, just wanted to go through a few intro slides here and uh, talk a little about what's going on here and what we're doing uh, before you get to see some of John's uh, fun science experiments. So uh, John, if you could take the next slide for me. So our current situation, we're all obviously working in some unique times here. And I think the uh, testament that we had 500 registrations to this uh, webinar uh, sure shows that. Um, so currently, you know, we are following the government guidelines here. We're all working from home and, and working hard to uh, uh, support our members the best we can. Um, one of the big things we're working on is education resources. So whether it's uh, for technicians, schools, uh, we're, we're trying to adjust the best we can here. So uh, one small thing we're doing now is every Thursday we're going to be doing these uh, live webinars. Uh, we are currently limited to 500 of them, uh, 500 participants, but we are going to post these on our LMS as well as onto our YouTube page following these. So uh, if you're an instructor out there or whoever you may be, if you'd like to share this, rewatch it, uh, you'll have that opportunity. Uh, probably within 24 hours, we should have that up. Um, and please let us know if you have any topics. Um, the goal is to create as much as we can to support you guys in this uh, tough time. So anything you got, feel free to shoot me an email, blow up my email box, and uh, let us help you. Uh, next slide, John. So some of our online resources. Uh, we recently launched our standard certification online. So if you're looking for a full certification course, uh, we have that opportunity now. So we launched that last week. Um, we are working really hard on resources for teachers and instructors. So that's where a lot of my time is being spent uh, trying to help them as more and more of them are going into this kind of remote learning, uh, which is really hard in a tech kind of world. Um, so uh, we also have for our self-study option, anybody who's ever taken one of our certifications where they've chose to purchase a study guide and then take the exam afterwards, uh, we actually have a digital online proctor now where you're able to test from home. So if you've at any point where you've been sitting around waiting to take an exam or uh, looking to do it, we can do that now. Uh, we also have our online learning through our learning management system uh, where we offer free micro courses. Uh, so log on there. They're free to our members. Check them out. Uh, we also have a sale currently on our basic electrical and corrosion mitigation course to uh, help feed that gap. And that's another really, really great resource uh, that we have out there. So take a look at that stuff. We got tons of it, uh, but we're trying and, and we're going to keep sending emails every week with some more and more of what we're doing for you guys. Um, so as far as this webinar goes, there should be a little question box in there for you. So any questions that you do have, uh, we're going to... Uh, save till the end. So uh, I'll read them off to John. So type them in there. We'll get to as many as we can uh, within our time here. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is a learning experience for us. We're really excited to be doing this. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce John Aidy, who's the president of ABYC. Uh, he started on the tech side of things like I did, but he started in 2003. Uh, and he's been our president for about six years now, and he's been doing a great job for us. So, uh, John, if you want to take over and uh, run us through some of your fun ex science experiments. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the um, uh, the kind words, and it's amazing what five bucks will make you say, my friend. So uh, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, but again, I am John Aidy. I'm the the president of ABYC. Uh, very interesting time for all of us right now, as Dave mentioned. And uh, so we felt uh, we'd take Thursday afternoons and uh, just do some some quick little webinars uh, on some things that we've had before, maybe some things we needed to research. So um, it was uh, painfully obvious that that it was going to be me that was going to do the first one. Uh, I figured I would take the step and and 500 people signed up. I see we have about 300 and some on, on now. Um, but that just says to me that our content is valuable and there's some good stuff out there. Uh, looking at some of the people that are on this uh, on this webinar, I have uh, people that I've seen that have been corrosion experts for a very, very long time. Uh, and there are individuals on here that obviously I don't recognize also. So um, let's start out by saying what this presentation is and what this presentation isn't. Um, so this presentation is a very simple look at corrosion, again, from the standpoint of an eighth grade science experiment. 
Um, what this presentation isn't is a license for you to go out and start doing corrosion inspections. Uh, that's that can be done through experience and through uh, through our classes and our certifications as well. And you can dive more and more into it. So if you are brand new to uh, uh, to the boating world and you're looking into uh, corrosion, this is a great way to find out what a corrosion tech might be doing to your boat and some of the tools that they'll use, some of the terms that they'll throw out there. Um, and if you are a seasoned technician, maybe this is a simple way to explain uh, to your customer exactly exactly what you're doing and uh, and what's going on underneath the boat and, and why certain things happen on, a, on an annual basis and, uh, and, and those kinds of discussions. It is not a highly technical presentation. Uh, so as we get into it, I will call out some of the questions I've had in the past uh, about some more of the technical side of things um, and, and let you know kind of why we, why we didn't get into that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this presentation. I would expect that you want to spend your probably your next 25 to 30 minutes with us. Uh, and as Dave said, please go ahead and start answering questions immediately, uh, and we'll get to those at the end of the uh, end of the presentation and uh, try to go through and answer as many of those as we can. Uh, so let's go ahead. So first of all, um, ABYC for me is a family thing. As Dave said, I've, I've actually been here since 2002, so it's been quite a long time. And um, this experiment was born out of uh, some boat work that we did. I would always haul the boat, like usually the hottest week in July, and uh, get the kids to come over and help me sand and replace anodes and a number of things you do while things are out of the water. So the question was, uh, and I'll tell you how long ago this presentation was done. The, the, the one in the front right there is now 21 years old. So uh, it's been quite a while. But the question was, why do we replace this thing every year? Uh, what, what is this thing that we that we run over to the marine supply store and we buy? Why do we pull it off? Why do we sand underneath it? Uh, and why do we just chuck it after we're done? It seems kind of ridiculous. So uh, knowing that that this science fair was coming up, we thought maybe it was a really good time to uh, to go ahead and investigate this and see if we could uh, see if we could mimic some of the results that we see under the boat uh, in a more controlled environment. Uh, and that's really where the the genesis of this presentation. And um, I gave it once a number of years ago, and it ended up in a survey. Surveyor, um, surveyor newsletter and um, it seems to, to just keep living on and so if, if you haven't seen this before uh, great if you have seen it before uh, I did add some things at the end so uh, stick around and, and we'll keep moving through it so why do we replace that anode every year that was the question and my answer winning father of the year award as I usually do was hey um, here's this giant phone book uh, turn to the standard called e2 and, and go ahead and read that and, and get back to me and we'll start talking so obviously that didn't really go over too well. Um, but what did come out of that is yes, ABYC does have a document. Um, this particular project was based on a 2013 standard um, and our standard is called E2, cathodic protection. The current version out on the street right now is 2019. And this particular standard talks about things like bonding systems and a lot of theoretical information about uh, about corrosion and cathodic protection and all of that. What it doesn't do is require a boat to have a bonding system. So if you do have a, uh, you know, have a boat, uh, you're a boat owner or you're a manufacturer or however you're coming from this and your particular product does not necessarily have a bonding system, it isn't necessarily not in compliance with ABYC. Uh, it's just that the if installed uh, component of this has been used. Uh, but mostly you're going to see bonding systems on a number of boats, especially modern ones. And, and we'll get into some of the reasons why uh, in, a, in a few moments. And we'll actually talk about what a bonding system is if you, if you don't know what that is. Um, so let's start with the very basics. This is out of our uh, 2018 version of our corrosion study guide. This is a, a drawing which, which really sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about and, and gets corrosion down to its most basic level. Um, it's called the corrosion quadrangle. And this corrosion quadrangle tells you what four items you're going to need to actually experience corrosion uh, when it comes to a boat. So we need our anode, uh, which sometimes they're called zincs, um, but it is an anode. Then we need our cathode. Uh, and then we need a common electrolyte. So um, start to think about what uh, what your area is and, and what that common electrolyte looks like. And then we also need a metallic path. So something actually uh, has to go through 
and um, connect our anode to our cathode uh, to be able to have something going on here. So if you don't have uh, one of, or one of these four elements, then probably what you're looking at is not necessarily galvanic corrosion. It could be simple corrosion, mechanical corrosion, um, and electrolytic is something we'll talk about in a little bit. But right now, what we're looking at here is is the four elements needed to have corrosion, and that's how our science experiment uh, was was set up. Uh, we have the anode, we have the cathode, we have our common electrolyte, and we have our metallic path. So uh, this diagram gets us well on our way to uh, to taking a look at, at, at what we're going to need to have a successful experiment. So um, whoop, I guess I got to clear that, uh, that stuff out there. Sorry, guys, I'm used to doing this live. So um, let me get rid of my drawings there. So um, E2, again, cathodic protection. E2 brings us something called the galvanic series. And the galvanic series is a chart with a bunch of numbers next to it. And uh, when you break it down, you have our anodic or least noble. And this is where you're going to see those common materials uh, right here for um, uh, for your anodes. Um, so looking at things like magnesium and zinc and aluminum alloys, those are, are what you might see for anodes. Uh, so that makes sense there. But then we have our cathodes over here. And generally, these are the things that we are trying to protect with these three items here. So sacrificial and the items that we want to keep in place. So think through hulls uh, versus anode. Very simple thing to think about. Anode disappears, so your through holes don't. So that's really what we're trying to set up here. But I wasn't looking at practically doing this on a boat. What we were looking at is seeing uh, on this chart, could we combine some different metals that maybe you wouldn't necessarily see uh, and, and see what happens with them just based on the chart. So that's really where, where we're going with this science experiment. Um, so how are we going to set this up? Well, this is really the drawing of what we're looking at here. Again, uh, we have the anode. Uh, again, think this particular drawing is zinc, um, and we have it giving up electrons to uh, our, our cathode, and we end up with our electron flow, and if it's all proper, then we end up with a protected cathode um, and, a, uh, and a sacrificial anode. Uh, so you'll see it's uh, it's ended up disappearing here at this point. But um, this is exactly the scenario we were looking to go for. Our metallic path, again, let's talk about our quadrangle. We have our metallic path, we have our, um, our electrolyte, and we have our two uh, main players here, which are our anode and our cathode. So this drawing pretty much puts the, uh, the quadrangle into, um, into play and lets us know how we're doing on that. So moving on, how are we going to set this up? Uh, being a, a, a kind of an old school saltwater fish tank guy, I gave it up a number of years ago, but you know, you, you never really give that kind of stuff up. You go down to the pet store and you buy something called Instant Ocean, um, and that gives you all of the things you need to, uh, to make a saltwater environment in the, uh, in the comfort of your own kitchen. Uh, so grabbing some pots and pans out of, the, out of the kitchen and mixing up uh, a gallon or two of this, we were able to uh, replicate um, a fairly salty Atlantic Ocean style environment. Um, and um, some of you might ask, how did how did you measure that? How did you get that going? If there's any aquarium hobbyists here, you're going to know what this thing is here. This is a hydrometer, and you do any Google search, and it's going to tell you average saltwater specific gravity is 1.024. Uh, so we were right on the nose at 1.024, and this is our electrolyte. So we now have an electrolyte that, that replicates uh, reality um, as much as we could. And that's kind of our starting point. So now we have one part of our quadrangle there as we're as we're moving forward. Uh, so what's the next part of the setup? Uh, I've always felt that unless you have some kind of mason jar action, you really don't have a successful uh, science fair experiment. So of course you get the mason jars, um, which contains our electrolyte. We have our electrolyte. And now we have our anode and cathode set up. You'll see uh, on the left here, we set up a control. So we would take whatever metal we were interested in and we would hang it from a piece of non-conductive fish line and it would just hang there in the, uh, in the electrolyte. So that would, that would really um, uh, be our simple corrosion experiment. What would happen if, if we really didn't have any connection here at all and, and these two were just on their own? And then over on the right, over here, you'll see that we have uh, the setup. Um, one of those more technical comments that I've been asked as I present this in various places is, did you account for the copper wire um, in, in your in your equation? Um, no, I didn't. That is just our that's just our connection there, and it just happens to be uh, you know some copper wire that that connects the two metals that we were interested in in working on. So what you'll see down here in the bottom is our layout. We uh, we set these up. 
put them on a workbench, you ended up with a control and then our, our experiment. So there's copper and there's copper attached to another metal. We have um, uh, brass by itself and then brass attached to another metal and then we have a steel nail and then steel nail attached to another metal so we now have a setup uh, all we need now is time uh, and and a series of photographs over a four-week period so um, the stage is set uh, we have our quadrangle there we have our mason jars and we have a, a, the makings of a successful science fair experiment so let's take a look at test number one uh, readily available materials from the house included things like copper from a half inch copper pipe and uh, items like stainless steel and we had some I had some 316 stainless around so uh, drill a hole in that drill a hole in our copper uh, the copper was a little dirty so I did kind of burnish that on a, on a wire brush the stainless I did not and and you'll see where that kind of gets us a little bit as we move on to the next uh, the next slide here. So uh, again, um, the, the control by itself, copper sitting there in our electrolyte by itself, and then copper attached to stainless steel. Remember, um, our anodes are up top, our cathodes are on the bottom. So the premise here was that our copper was gonna sacrifice itself in order to uh, keep the stainless steel from doing anything. A lot of people are under the impression that stainless steel is actually stainless. Um, it is when it's exposed to free flowing water or free flowing air and has some oxygen to allow it to get its own protection. So it quote unquote, let's say rusts for a real simple, uh, simplistic explanation, but it does create a, uh, a passive uh, coating, which makes it stainless. And uh, the reason I mention that is because uh, let's take a look here at our at our jars as we get things going. Here's the first combo and control, copper hanging by itself, copper hanging and now connected to our stainless. So as I said before, uh, I would expect that the copper would start to give itself up a little bit uh, in order to make sure that the stainless didn't have an issue. Um, but that's not necessarily what we found after four weeks. So what we're seeing here is, is a photograph of four weeks later, and you'll see that, um, that Statue of Liberty-esque green color on the bottom here, which is what we would expect when copper starts to, to oxidize. Um, and so we're gonna we're calling these metal hydroxides because it's pieces of the metal that, that end up down here. And then over here, I'm seeing exactly the same scenario um, as, the, as the copper control. So when you look at that, you kind of scratch your head and you go, all right, I have copper on the right by itself. I have copper and stainless on the left, but I have really the, the same level of coloration at the bottom of our jars, the same amount of, of hydroxides that we do. So why is that acting like that? Well, really what it is, is it's simple electrochemical corrosion um, based on the copper by itself. What I neglected to do, and I said it before, is I didn't take a wire brush to the stainless. So the stainless never really had the opportunity to do anything uh, or offer up uh, you know, anything um, on, the, on the, bottom of the bottom of the jar or, or create more activity in the copper as it acted as an anode, simply because it was passive. It had its own. Um, it had its own protection. Uh, it had been sitting on the shelf for a long period of time, and for some reason, I just didn't take a wire brush to it. So the um, the moral of the story on that one is: um, make sure that when you connect your uh, your other piece of metal, that it's actually going to be uh, conductive, because at this point, it, it really wasn't. It was protected. It remained stainless. It did exactly what it what it was supposed to do, or what you would want stainless to do in a saltwater environment, where the copper just happily sat there and, and oxidized and uh, and gave us a little bit of green. So. So um, that was our experiment number one. So again, um, my fault, but a good learning experience that you know stainless became very passive. So when you think about things like painting your anodes, um, basically you're, you're doing exactly the same thing. You, you would be painting an anode that was meant to be exposed to the water and uh, therefore could not dissolve and could not do its, uh, its protection job to the other metal that's there. So let's take a look at test number two. A uh, piece of zinc, I believe that came from an old uh, mercury outboard trim tab um, that was subjected to the bandsaw. And then we took a little yellow brass, which was a hardware store item. Uh, and we connected those two together to see what would happen. Yellow brass being um, yeah, similar to, to some metals that you would find uh, underwater. Uh, maybe not exactly in those uh, in, in these uh, percentages there, um, but at least you know for an eighth grade science experiment, pretty, pretty acceptable. Um, so here's our combo and our control. Again, the uh, lopped off piece of trim tab there and our piece of brass by itself. Uh, and then moving along, what did we see? So um, what we have here is a successful experiment. Um, 
because of the the content here of the metal you'll see again that that statue of liberty-esque hydroxide on the bottom you'll see kind of that green um that green hue to the bottom of it but when it comes to the uh the actual setup with our with our anode on it we don't see that green hue um as, as a matter of fact we kind of see a um almost a zinc colored cloudiness there indicating that we're getting uh some some hydroxides off the zinc so that the zinc metal is actually working and keeping the uh the brass from uh from turning that green color uh, so here we actually had the success this was uh, exactly what we expected um and again you, you can kind of see that 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 lighter fogginess down here where our brass again has that greenish tint that you would expect of, of something that was uh, oxidizing in um, uh, in salt water by itself so uh, moving on what were our uh, what were our notes here on this one um, exactly what we would expect we we have successfully set up the anode cathode experiment in the electrolyte so um, this explained the question why do we why do we replace that piece of uh, piece of stuff on the bottom of the boat every year well this is why you do it because um, it, you're going to protect your propeller shaft you're going to protect anything else pr uh, attached to that bonding system with with our wire right here attached to the different things that needed to be protected uh, from the uh, from the anode um, so clearly see the difference here and that one was a, a pretty good success so let's look at something a little bit different Test number three, you may say, well, why are you picking something that's so close on the galvanic series? Because obviously the farther away on that chart, we're going to get more dramatic results. This resulted from a meeting that I was, I was uh, at in, um, in Iowa and we were, uh, we were on the river and um, we were looking at some giant locks and uh, you know, boat locks and the um, Army Corps of Engineers was giving a presentation on the protection of those locks and how they deal with them. And they had mentioned that those steel locks were uh, protected by aluminum anodes um, and I scratched my head a little bit and kind of said all right well that's that's interesting because I know what this chart looks like and I, I didn't know you know that 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 would actually work those of you who've been in the business for a while obviously dust steel barge how are you going to protect those so you know this was a number of years ago and I wanted to try this experiment and just see what would happen so of course we went and set that up as well we have our uh, steel nail uh, which I did uh, hit on the um, hit on the wire brush uh, on the bench as well and now we have our piece of aluminum which again was off of another uh, anode kit from uh, from another outboard uh, so we subjected that to the bandsaw got us a little bite-sized chunk and uh, made our connection and went about waiting for our four weeks. Um, and so lo and behold, look what happens. We end up with a, um, a steel nail that is doing exactly what you would expect if a steel nail was dropped in salt water. It's just happily rusting away and showing us uh, really, really uh, undeniable evidence of that, um, of, of that rusting process that's going on there. And then on the left, we have our steel nail and it's attached to our piece of zinc or our piece of aluminum and there's our anode and we have the perfect example of steel being protected by aluminum um, and the experiment worked perfectly and it showed exactly what I was looking for we also got a little added bonus here um, and if you're looking at this it looks a little bit fuzzy there but what we're what we're seeing is um, is a little over protection uh, possibly so we're looking at uh, at some bubbling and some hydrogen atoms that are escaping there and creating this uh, this bubbling effect so that was kind of a bonus on this one didn't really matter for the experiment but for the point of discussion when you're talking about corrosion it was interesting to be able to see that um, that we were actually having a little bit of uh, a little bit of um, hydrogen um, issues here so um, and and why does that happen there's a lot of science behind that and where where that happens and what the results are but basically what we're looking at is uh, more than likely in this scenario it's it's over protection so there's there's too much surface area in our aluminum here as opposed to the amount of surface that's on our steel nail so it's going into an over protection type mode um, which can can severely damage wood boats uh, arguable on fiberglass and, um, and and other types of uh, and obviously metal can be uh, over protected as well but that's why you can't just chuck anodes on a boat and decide that everything's going to be okay there's a science to it and we talked briefly about that toward the end of this so um, got a little two bonuses here one yep steel can be protected by by aluminum um, you know thanks John everybody's kind of known that probably on this call but it was nice to see it on the uh, in the experiment uh, and be able to prove that um, so an outside shot here we have that uh, that lighter colored hydroxide action down here we have our, our rust color here 
So um, we're really seeing evidence of both of these types of uh, types of reactions and the um, the anode cathode uh, relationship here. Uh, so that particular experiment um, definitely a success on that one also. Um, so I think we talked about it. What's what's going on here? Um, you know, there's there's a number of things, but you know the 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 quickness of the rust on the steel nail was nice to see, um, and then you can see the hydrogen bubbles, um, and that can have a number of different problems um, in wood boats. It's called delignification. Uh, if you spell that, I'll send you a hat. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's that's a wood boat issue. And then uh, experts all over the place discuss uh, fiberglass uh, fiberglass boats and what that can cause or doesn't cause. And uh, you know, that's one of those discussions that's uh, for a much more technical presentation or or certification. Um, so with that, we had a very successful experiment, um, and we've set you all up with the basics of what goes on underneath the boat. The next thing I want to talk about in, in a very brief scenario is what are the tools and what are some of the things that we need to look at when it comes to um, corrosion analysis and what a, what a technician might be performing on your boat or um, uh, some of the factors that they have to look at that makes this such, a, such an interesting and uh, sometimes very difficult to understand issue um, outside of a bunch of mason jars sitting on a workbench. Um, so, you know, you see this picture here and, you know, one of the tools that can be used is a common multimeter, but I want, what I want you to see is, um, you know, measuring down to the, the millivolt level here. So a negative 0.835, that coincides with those numbers that you saw earlier in my experiment with the, uh, with the galvanic series. So hopefully all this will make sense as we go through uh, just a couple more slides. We're, we're nearing the end here. Um, so an important thing that you might not think about when it comes to corrosion and how fast anodes are disappearing or the fact that anodes aren't disappearing at all um, and scratching your head and trying to figure some of these things out, there's a lot of things at play here. And this slide kind of breaks them down a little bit. Water chemistry, really, really big deal. Um, and it's uh, we've had fresh water that has uh, some conductivity real heavy salt water uh, here in the bay. I'm uh, actually in the office today doing this presentation. You're looking out at water that's, uh, who knows what it is right now. We just had a heavy, heavy rainfall probably every other day for the last three days. Um, so what what is that water right now? Is it more fresh? Is it more salt? What's the brackish look like? Um, and will that change when we don't get any rain for July and August and it's 97 degrees outside? Those are things you have to take a look at. Um, has the boat been moved? Are, are you are you next to a neighbor um, that that maybe did some wiring on his boat that that isn't necessarily proper? Um, you know, where where were you before and where are you now? Um, how long did it take for this corrosion to actually happen? Was this uh, three four days? Uh, or was this uh, over months and months uh, period of time? How often are you using the boat? Is it sitting there? Uh, is it is it not getting the opportunity to get the slime off the bottom and on the anodes? Um, has any electrical work been done? That's that's extremely important. Uh, did someone confuse the uh, the green wire for a, you know a DC negative terminal and and they they broke into that or or were some other things done on the on the boat? Um, and then uh, E2. Uh, through our standards really helps you narrow all that stuff down so you can figure out what's going on. Um, so let's talk about uh, reference cell. So in order to measure uh, what that what the millivolt value is to, to be able to make sense of that chart, you need some tools. So as you saw in the picture before, uh, that millivolt uh, capable uh, voltmeter had a positive and a negative uh, cable attached to it. You need a reference cell. You need uh, on on one side on the positive side of your uh, of your multimeter, and that reference cell is going to be uh, either a metal called silver silver chloride or it's going to be zinc. Those are the two most uh, familiar ones that are out there. Um, Ed Sherman is uh, is our recently retired VP of Education, and he likes the silver silver chloride cell because there's no calculations involved. It, it has a millivolt value of zero. Um, the other side of your multimeter is going to be attached to the bonding system or those underwater metals. So you would have a really, really long reference cell cable uh, or and a really, really long black cable that has an alligator clip at the end that would go to the bonding system. And when you are clipped to the bonding system, meaning the underwater metals that are connected to uh, to the to the 
common wires uh, and you put the reference cell over the wa over the side of the boat and you wait a little bit you're going to start to see what those values are so that's when those uh, that's when those numbers on the side of the galvanic series chart actually start to make sense uh, and they make even more sense when uh, you look at e2 and e2 starts to give you the the lowdown of what those readings should look like on different hull types so when you hear reference cell um, that's really what this is it hangs in the water uh, and it is a reference to what are uh, what electrically is going on outside the boat uh, that is either uh, causing uh, causing issues or preventing issues. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're working. Uh, this is a photo of a um, a ready-made corrosion meter. Uh, its only purpose is is to detect corrosion. And again, you'll see that that really long reference cell um, kind of up here to the right. Uh, that that is our reference cell, our positive wire. It attaches to uh, to this uh, particular item here, our our meter, and then I have my alligator clamp for my bonding system or wherever I choose to hook that up in the boat. Um, and this is only for corrosion. That's all it does. So it's it's gonna it's gonna measure what's going on outside the boat. Um, a, a terrific owner's manual that comes with it that tells you what's going on. It's in line with ABYC's E2, and you can go ahead and push some buttons, and you can set um, you can set it to the type of boat that you're going to do your corrosion survey on, whether it be fiberglass or, uh, again, that steel barge we just mentioned, could be an aluminum boat, could be a wood boat, and, and that way it'll, it'll tell you right away whether you're in the, the, the range of protection for those particular, uh, those particular materials. So a uh, pretty handy item. Um, I, we did sell this through ABYC and a, a Couple, number of years ago, um, it's around two hundred dollars, and uh, I would tell you that if you're interested in another group buy for that, if you decide that you want to get a hold of one of these, um, go ahead and email info at abycinc.org and tell me you want the corrosion meter, and we can go ahead and try to get a bunch of them again because it is a, a handy little tool that um, you know will give you a reference and kind of tell you where you are. Um, doesn't make you a corrosion tech, um, but it does it does help you understand what's going on outside the boat. So um, you know you can use your own meter with a silver silver chloride reference cell and that's what this one is right here um, they're pretty pricey uh, but this is what it would look like if you go and buy a reference cell in the open market that you're going to hook up to your fluke meter or your higher end uh, digital uh, digital multimeter that that you might already have for some other uh, for some other work so um, these type of units are available as well they're you know readily available professional mariners a name some of you might know um, you know those are produced there there's there's a number of different uh, outlets to go ahead and get those but the tools for this are um, are readily available I think um, one of my favorite slides on this is to clear up some common issues uh, discussed by gods um, God is not the Almighty here God stands for guys on docks and uh, guys on docks have a lot of information to give you. Um, it's kind of like Wikipedia. Do you want to believe it or don't you want to believe it? So let's talk about a couple things that we hear all the time from our guys on docks and uh, things that we can dispel really, really quickly. Um, the term electrolytic corrosion, that is when you actually have uh, some voltage involved other than just uh, naturally occurring external voltage because of the differences in metals. Um, electrolytic corrosion, it could be a, uh, a, positive, um, a positive wire hooked up somewhere uh, improperly. It could be a bad bilge pump where the positive wire, the positive current is actually getting into the bonding system. But uh, that is something that happens fast. So, um, you know, as Ed tells us here on this slide, 24 to 48 hours, um, if a battery charger is hooked up improperly, and that's a big amperage battery charger, like 60 amps, it may happen a lot faster if it's just an occasionally operating bilge pump. Um, thinking back to our, our uh, mason jars, when that was over, I actually end up, ended up using uh, as an experiment uh, the, the um, the jars as a return conductor for a small DC motor, and I can tell you that the uh, the ends of the copper wire were gone within within seconds. Um, so this happens very quickly. Um, galvanic corrosion takes considerably longer. So what we were looking at, there was no electricity involved uh, from an external source in our our mason jar experiment. So galvanic corrosion will take a while to show up. So um, you pull the boat in the fall, and the anode is a little bit deteriorated. Uh, that's what we're looking at. And then simple corrosion takes years or decades to show up, except for our steel nail, which ended up really just happening. Um, I'm gonna put a plug in here for a term called electrolysis. 
please people, if you take anything from this presentation, do not use the term electrolysis. It does not exist in, in proper uh, galvanic corrosion terms. It, it really, I mean, it, it's what happens to women's legs when they want to get rid of some hair. It is not um, something that you want to use in the scientific community uh, if you're talking about uh, galvanic corrosion. We're talking about electrolytic, galvanic, or simple. Uh, those are the things that we're talking here. There also is another one called mechanical. Um, let's say you have uh, a boat that is in a very, very very fast current river, um, you can actually find that things get worn away uh, by that current. So um, another thing that, that is probably a little more inside baseball than some of you may be uh, willing to listen to, but um, ABYC has said for years that, that AC current is not what causes corrosion, it's really DC. So um, for the purposes of, of this, um, you know, you'll hear people talking about a hot marina, for instance, where uh, the AC has issues all over the place, and then there's the in-water shock discussion, which is uh, a whole nother, a whole nother realm. But um, it can happen. Um, they again inside baseball ac current can happen uh, but it isn't one of those things that you're just going to going to see and be able to, to look at quickly whereas the electrolytic corrosion actually shows us as you'll see in the next slide uh, some pretty severe evidence of what's going on um, underneath the uh, underneath the drive so um, anybody tell me what this is i know you're not able to talk to me but i'm just going to take a guess that a lot of you are looking at that going what the heck is it um, that used to be a bow thruster um, and uh, we're not, you know, it's not a sea monster. Um, people aren't trying to grind away at it. Uh, this was on a brand new boat, and you can read the slide as much as I can. But what we were looking at is a um, is a fault, uh, a a very low level DC positive fault uh, that shorted to the bow thruster housing, and we ended up with a very fast electrolytic issue. Uh, that, that resulted in, in this kind of catastrophic damage. Um, so there's no repair for this. Uh, there's an insurance claim, uh, and there is a new uh, there's a new drive uh, that was that was installed there, or a new thruster. So um, this is physical evidence of the theoretical discussion that we just had on electrolytic corrosion. So you'll see that that happens, um, which is which is interesting as well. Um, quick story: uh, we were we were diagnosing a, another brand new boat in the port of Baltimore. And uh, the anodes were disappearing um, within, you know, six weeks or so of installing them. They were about half the size that, that they should have been. So um, trying to figure out what's going on, we checked the boat and um, just really, really dove into the, the, the corrosion survey. There were two or three other guys that have been doing this for years and um, got to the kind of the middle of the day and, and didn't really have any answers. Um, and then all of a sudden the meter started to shoot up and, and we saw that, that there were some issues here. We were starting to see a little bit of, little bit of DC current. Um, turns out that um, the uh, bonding system was being affected by a television that was on board. There was a, a three-prong uh, three plug that plugged into the outlet and they were connected to the dockside cable TV. And every time they would turn the TV on, there was some kind of stray current that was coming through the cable TV um, the cable TV connection and that transformer inside the television actually turned on and, and connected that to the bonding system. So the solution was um, don't watch so much TV, uh, Mr. Boat Owner, or one of those uh, those three to two pin ground eliminators, which is ultimately what they ended up doing. So 69 cents uh, saved the uh, saved the anode. So uh, this is why corrosion can be such a such an interesting and, and serious uh, kind of NCIS moment for a number of people that are involved in it. Um, so let's talk about uh, the bonding system. You'll see over here, let's get our hotspot over here. This is ABYC's color for bonding wires. Um, they are a number eight AWG. So you can take a look and, and see those. And they're typically connected to our underwater metals uh, and things like sea strainers and a number of other things that happen. Um, and this is where you're going to end up getting uh, the setup to be able to read the hull potential or those millivolt numbers that you saw in the, um, the galvanic series chart. So uh, my favorite diagram in ABYC, you know you've been at ABYC too long when you have a favorite diagram, is figure 10. Figure 10, you know, I could do 27 presentations on figure 10 and still not have them all done. But for these purposes today, this sets up a pretty typical scenario in a, uh, in a boat. And here we have our bonding system very nicely outlined. Um, let's take a look at its genesis. We have a negative terminal that goes to our, our engine so that we can start it. And then we go to our, our main DC bus. And from here, 
we end up with our uh, our grounding bus, and our grounding bus goes to things like our seacock, our strainer, our uh, electronics ground plate, if you had one, chain plates, if they're part of a lightning protection system, totally other discussion. Uh, our, our zinc, this is should be properly uh, labeled anode because we have other choices these days, um, but that is how that happens. So you can see uh, in my television example, the AC grounding bus is also connected. So when that ground pin uh, was able to convey that that low level DC current uh, that existed on the cable TV uh, wire, uh, it could actually transmit that directly to things that were in in contact with seawater. So uh, this is a nice visual to tell you what your bonding system should end up looking like uh, and and where it goes uh, within the boat. So um, diagram 10 guys, ABYC E11, uh, it's one that you should uh, should be very very familiar with. So um, moving on from our bonding system, what, what type of anode should you use? Uh, this is just a quick uh, quick um, shot of, of what E2 says, and uh, it's, it's backed up by the major anode manufacturers. But rule of thumb, we're seeing aluminum is really uh, kind of a choice for all types of uh, all types of boats. If you have uh, you know the Seattle area, for instance, you could be in freshwater, uh, and then four hours later you could be in saltwater. So uh, aluminum is a good choice. A lot of um, a lot of municipalities are starting to frown on zinc and starting to uh, to eliminate the ability to use zinc um, from a from an environmental standpoint. So that um, aluminum is really taking taking that over there. So calling them zincs anymore really is not the right term. It's a an anode and is it aluminum is it zinc or magnesium uh, magnesium has a, a wonderful place in freshwater uh, but not necessarily in um, in saltwater uh, or brackish uh, so that's where that is um, this is probably a good time to mention something else called a um, um, impressed current system um, an impressed current system is uh, really a fancy term for an item that will actually produce its own electricity in order to balance the um, the, the millivolt level um, un underneath the boat so if if for some reason you can't get the boat right you have a couple big stern drives on there and you just can't put enough enough anodes on there to be able to get your um, to, to get it in the proper levels then an impressed current system will do that job for you automatically again a whole nother discussion but if you ever hear that term impressed current system what it's doing is it's making up for the inability to put uh, enough uh, anodes on there um, so a couple key points to remember uh, once you decide in your anode material, um, you can add more anodes to get your, your right potential. Um, and if you add more anodes, uh, you know, the, the common thought is that it'll just add to the service life. Um, this is also an interesting point. Surface area adjusts the voltage level while mass adjusts the longevity. So, um, you know, adding a giant square, unless you're uh, increasing that, that surface area, it's not really helping. But if you make it a rectangle and it's long and it has a, a large surface that's facing the, um, you know, facing the salt water and is exposed to the, to the electrolyte, uh, then you're going to have a little bit better choice there. Um, looking ahead a little bit, um, here are the millivolt ranges from E2 that you should be looking at. Um, so it's our recommended range of cathodic protection, and this is what you're looking at. Your reading should be on your, your multimeter or the meter that um, that we showed earlier. Uh, fiberglass in this range, then wood, aluminum, steel, uh, non-metallic with aluminum drives, and this is where we talked about that hydrogen issue that you saw in the in the mason jars. Uh, if you uh, if you end up exceeding this for wood, you end up with something called delignification, which results in something like this. So it really does destroy the wood. Um, uh, and the only the only option there is to go ahead and replace that. So here's a, a good example of, of that delignification that's going on there. But again, um, hopefully the numbers on that galvanic series chart now make sense and uh, the ability to read them and interpret them and figure out how to make them correct uh, is really what the science is between uh, cathodic protection. So um, if you have water other than our instant ocean, you're going to need to do this in the water. If you want a, corrosion, a correct corrosion survey done and the boat is on the hard, um, 
there's really no way to do a correct survey on the heart. It has to be in the electrolyte, preferably in the electrolyte that it's going to exist in. Um, I know new boats that are delivered uh, way up in, in New Jersey, up, up a river, and uh, the readings that are taken there are different than the ones when they're actually outfitted down in Florida. So uh, things are changed, anodes are added, um, and, and things are done differently. But uh, you know, anyone who tells you that a corrosion survey can properly be done with a calculation method uh, and saying, okay, I need X pounds of, of zinc or X pounds of aluminum on the boat um, is, uh, you know, snake oil salesman. Uh, can't happen. It actually has to be in the water uh, and things have to be right. You might be able to get close with a calculation, but if you really, really want to dial it in, it's going to have to be in uh, the electrolyte, preferably the one that, um, that it's going to be in uh, when you're putting it into service. So um, with that, um, I'm pretty much done here, Dave. And again, I got my wizard here. Uh, that is not Ed Sherman, even though it looks like him. Uh, but our wizard friend here is uh, is indicating that this is uh, it's not a black art. It is a science. But there are a lot of moving parts to corrosion, and you want an expert. Uh, if you're a boater and you're on the call, then uh, you're going to want to go to uh, findaboattech.org, and you're going to look for somebody who has our corrosion certification. Uh, if you are an expert on the on the call and you have our corrosion certification, thank you so much for uh, for taking our course and making sure that that you can do this properly. And if you're considering it. Um, I would suggest anyone on the call have the electrical certification first. It's not a prerequisite, but I would suggest it. Uh, and then you can go ahead and try your corrosion cert, which I believe we have here in Annapolis in November, uh, which we're going to be offering the brand new curriculum. And you also see, I think Wednesday, we are releasing our uh, brand new corrosion study guide. Uh, and that's always a really good thing to have, even if you are not looking at taking a class. Uh, so Dave, you want to jump on and start reading me some questions here, my friend? Sure. Yeah. First, I want to thank everyone for their engagement because I don't know if John realized what he said, but we got about 15 to 20 different spellings of delignification. So uh, we'll pull a name out of a hat and we will get you a hat for that. So, Excellent. John, you, you offered a hat. We're giving a hat. Yeah. Terrific. Um, <laughs> well, they're listening, which is great. So I got the names and the order and everything. So I'll pull a name and you'll get an email. Exactly. So uh, we did get a good amount of questions here. So I know we do have some time for a few here. So let's start with Please explain the difference, uh, advantage, and grounding between a galvanic isolator and an isolation transformer. Um, you know that that kind of goes into um, a, a lot more than than today's presentation. Suffice it to say. Um, both of these items, and, and, and we'll leave it at this, both of these items have the, abil the ability to isolate the dockside ground uh, from the boatside ground. Uh, they do it in two different manners, uh, but both of them have the ability to, um, uh, to be able to, to deal with, uh, with any kind of faults. So uh, isolation transformers do them through an air gap. Uh, galvanic isolations uh, or galvanic isolators do it through a series of diodes um, and and more solid state ones as well. So um, I think that's a little that's more of an electrical certification call. But suffice to say that example that I had about the the cable TV uh, with a little bit of stray current on that on that cable TV wire uh, that can happen on an AC grounding wire. Uh, in abundance and, and does happen quite a bit. So you have a galvanic isolator and an isolation transformer. They both create a gap between that harmful straight current coming onto your boat and uh, getting into diagram 10 and being able to put two to three volts DC onto your, your bonding system. So I hope that helps. All right, next question. Were the bottles stirred over the duration to ensure that the salts didn't settle out? Uh, no, and that's one of the reasons I used um, I used instant ocean instead of uh, table salt. Um, even at the at the four week period, you wouldn't see anything gathering on the bottom. That that instant ocean dissolves very very nicely uh, and and stays uh, you know stays in suspension um, uh, nicely. So I didn't want to stir it because I couldn't stir everything evenly, and I also wanted to see those hydroxides settle to the bottom. Um, so yeah, that's why we didn't stir it. I think you touched on this, but just to reiterate, the question is, uh, is there a ratio of anode to cathode that allows it to work? Is it possible to have too little or too much anode? Uh, how is it calculated? I think you touched on that a little bit, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's um, let, let me stress the point that, um, yes, there, there absolutely is a ratio. Um, that ratio is evidenced by the proper, uh, the, the proper millivolt range of the chosen material that you're working on. And um, adding more and uh, taking some apart will we'll adjust those. All right. 
digging through my spellings of delignification here. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, how do David. you tell the difference between zinc, aluminum? <laughs> hey, it's good stuff. Right. Uh, how do you tell the difference between zinc, aluminum, and magnesium anodes if they're on uh, the boat without removal? Oh man, guys. Um, so uh, you know, you take a take a company like um, uh, Canada Metals, for instance. They they stamp what theirs are, but if it's half gone, um, you know, I I don't know. I mean, there may be some old salts out there who can like lick it and be like, yeah, that's aluminum. Um, that's not me. Um, and please, I am not advising licking anodes. It's not what I was here for. Um, but yeah, I I. There's probably some some guys out there on the on the uh, call right now that'll be able to say, yep, just do this and it's fine. Uh, but I would say that you can't you can't tell. That's why it's important uh, for the boat owner to have a uh, an invoice or something that says on June 6th, 19 uh, or you know 2019, uh, we put aluminum anodes on this boat. All right. Do reference cells wear out over time? Hmm. Um. Again, that's probably a question for somebody who's used one a lot. I know they can, um, you know, I, I know if they've been sitting in a toolbox for a while, they can actually start to to get their own uh, kind of corrosion on them. You end up with a white milky uh, milky surface on the end of it. Um, so I would think you can certainly contaminate them um, by, you know, doing bad things with them. Um, but do they wear out over time? Um, good, good question. And uh, I'd have to research that a little bit. I mean, my first inclination is uh, probably not. Um, but I think they definitely can be contaminated. All right. How important is it to remove oxidation from anodes on boats that are stored in a boat hell or in a lift? Uh, how important is it? Well, first of all, if the boat's on a lift, uh, it probably doesn't have the opportunity to set up the uh, electrolyte issues for that long. I mean, if they're out for a weekend or something, um, it isn't really a, you know, isn't really a big deal. Um, but in my opinion, why would you have anodes on there if you're not going to keep them in top shape? So don't paint them, um, you know, take a, take a piece of bronze wool to them or, um, you know, a small wire brush and, and, uh, and clean them up if you think you need to. But again, boats that are, that are not in the water. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but water is really bad for boats. Um, so boats that are not in the water are not necessarily subjected to what we're, what we're talking about here because they don't have that electrolyte. We've taken one piece of that quadrangle out. Uh, so, you know, just a, a use over a period of time, um, you know, for even a week, uh, probably won't have a huge effect uh, unless you're looking at electrolytic. All right. We got time for a few more, more here. Uh, there seems to be some confusion over. Uh, confusion out there, whether to connect bonding system to the negative bus. Can you speak to this, please? Um, well, I'm going to go back to the ABYC party line, um, and, and I'll go ahead and flip back here again, because it's always good to see. Um, I work for ABYC. I believe in the standards. I read the standards. I have worked with experts over my entire career, and guys, this is what I am recommending. So if you are confused, uh, go ahead and uh, look at figure 10 in ABYC E11 and this is how you want it so um i'm not confused um and you know this this uh this is from the current standard this has not been changed there are a lot of uh, a lot of pundits out there a lot of a lot of guys on docks um but you know go to the letter of the law guys this is what you want to look at all right and i think time wise john i think we want to wrap up on questions so we can uh, keep this to that hour um, I know there are some more questions out there. Uh, feel free at the end of this. Uh, something to add, John? I, I, I did actually. I just got right, yelled at. At the at end of this, you will get an email from the system. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I got yelled at over text by our marketing director, and she told me that it's findaboattech.com, not findaboattech.org. So even on a webinar, I can't escape uh, technology. <laughs> So yeah, any of these questions, if we didn't get a chance to get to them, uh, email myself, John. Uh, there will be an email that goes out tomorrow. Uh, just to recap, thanking you guys for attending. Uh, if you reply to that, it will come to me. Any ideas you guys have, recommendations, feel free to send them our way. Uh, we're more than willing to try to figure out how to do this, and maybe we do more of it. Maybe we, whatever it is, um, we're working through the same situation you guys are. So we're trying to make the best of it uh, and help you guys as best we can. So. Uh, when we have this posted on YouTube, we will have links to some of our other content and whatnot in the uh, 
description and whatnot. So there will be access. We'll be sending out more emails. We'll be trying to connect as much as we can. So anything you could do for us or that, that we can do for you rather, shoot us an email and, and we will work our best to support you guys through this time. John, you got anything to add? No, thank you everybody for attending. It's, uh, you know, looking at it right now, we have a 99% um, audience view here. I know on some of our board meetings, I don't get anywhere near that. So thanks for paying attention. Hope uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, looking forward to uh, next Thursday with uh, Mr. Mike Boniker. So uh, thanks, Dave. Thanks everybody else. Yeah, perfect. And, and like I mentioned, this will be on YouTube. Uh, we'll do them all like that. So if you're an educator or someone wants to share this with their staff, within the next 24 hours or so, we should have that link up there. We'll send some emails out. So uh, this will be open. Use it. Uh, and anything we could do, again, please let us know how we can help. And everyone enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, all. Have a great day. Thanks.